We are extremely delighted to welcome Steffi, Miriam, and Zara from, um, from the organization Family Freaks, who will be talking to us about how mom, mom, dad, ch child is not the only model of a family that there is, but that there are many other different kinds of families, more parents, more partners, more of everything, maybe like just burn everything to the ground and start again from zero, um, how that works um, and how you can do that. So I'm extremely happy to have these three here and that they'll be talking to us about it. So yeah, please um, give us a nice r loud round of applause for them. Check, check, is the mic working? Ah. Oh. Ah, right. No, no, it's working. I have figured out how to turn it on. Thank you. Thank you for uh, that kind introduction. Hello and a uh, warm welcome to everyone. We are Steffi Kra, Miriam Welk, and Sarah Diel. Um, and we are gathering here under the name Family Freaks. Um, we're using this name to brand ourselves as people who are outcast from the regular ideal of a family. Um, and we think um, this ideal of the heteronormative small family um, based on monogamy that always lives together, reproduces itself, um, and is really the core part of the state, keeps, this, keeps um, the economy running. We think that's a myth. It's increasingly turning into a myth. Um, and it's increasingly further away from the lived reality of families and is actually starting to harm them. Miriam and myself, um, we've been working for one year um, on creating a festival named Familia Futura. The festival will be happening from um, September 14th to 16th in um, Dresden. And that was kind of the occasion on which we are gathering here. Yeah, precisely. So. Over there, we want to talk about alternative strategies of living together um, and look at potential visions for the future that go beyond the oppressiveness and isolation of small heteronormative families. So we'll have workshops, discussions, perform performances, music, and open rounds of discussion. So we'll create a space um, for uh, encounters and exchange. So we'll, for example, explore topics like um, social parenthood, um, and deal, we'll deal with reproduction, care work, love, and gender solidarity. Um, one concern that we have is that we want the diversity of lived realities of families will actually be represented as well. So this festival is obviously not only going to come into being because of a good idea, but because of a great network. There are associations, pop meetings, um, researchers, artists. And one of the particularly interesting people who we met through that is Zara Diel, and we're extremely happy to have her here and that we were able to bring her to Fusion with us. Zara is a publicist, author, and activist. Um, her topics are um, reproductive rights of women um, in international contexts, um, sexual self-determination, um, remaining childless, ch childless um, and social parenthood. In 2014, she published her book, The Clock That Doesn't Tick. Um, we have it here in the front, here in front as well. Um, and in this book, she analyzes the bad image of women who remain childless as something um, that is used to pressure them into unpaid care work. So for us, she'll be reading um, a text that was published in the newspaper Die Zeit in 2016, and it's called Baby Free Zones, um, Give Me All Your Diapers. So Zara, your turn. Hi, yeah, so I'll just start reading the text without actually like explaining anything and um, why uh, I'll particularly, especially be talking about like childlessness but I think that'll be uh, quite obvious from the from the text. So yeah, give me all your chil children, um, give me all your diverse child-free zones. Having to defend your own style of life as a women without children, which you have to do a lot, might bring you and push you into awkward situations. Um, when defending your own choices, you're often defending freedoms that parents don't have, not necessarily, um, not necessarily because they are constricted somehow, but because there's just no other opportunity. 
I had a similar feeling of like feeling uncomfortable when a journalist was de um, de was demanding baby free zones in trains and planes in the newspaper The Guardian. Me as like a model person without a child, um, who many might expect to uh, welcome that, um, think that this is going the completely incorrect direction. So children and their parents, or often their mothers, have been isolated in society for way too long. Um, it should be completely normal for all of us again to support them and their parents, to have an eye on them, um, to keep an eye on them if their mom falls asleep and potentially put the diapers into a trash can because the father needs to change diapers in the, on the train because, because the train is too full. One of the main reasons women don't want kids is that they want to avoid isolation that comes along with having kids. This isolation is like disturbing, is still disturbingly strong in Germany. The saying that you need an entire village to raise a kid, which kind of like implies a natural a shared work um, and a way of essentially taking pressure away from parents is something that's almost impossible in Germany, something that's almost impossible to implement. But how did it happen that raising children has something that has become so isolated? In almost all interviews that I did with parent with of with women without children, they kept coming back to this motive of kind of disappearing from the family um, by having and di 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 disappearing from the society by having a kid, right? So there's this wish to still belong to society um, despite having a kid, right, and still belonging. People who don't have kids, uh, women who don't have kids, take care of the kids of their friends. Um, not not as a compensation, but because it's a human taking care of others. When so when I was presenting my book in Graz in Austria, um, a 70-year-old woman was uh, raising a question. She said she said that she grew up on um, on a farm with a big family and lots of other with lots of other people helping out. She was kind of just like playing around all everywhere, and everyone who was around was taking care of her. She was kind of describing this very happy childhood where she had many different her people of reference, which we call social parenthood. So there wasn't just that one single mother who was frustrated um, and had too much work. When we were talking about this, we agreed that the creation of the small family is something like an historic ac historical accident because this isolation is inhumane that comes with it. But how did we get to this historical accident that happened around 200 years ago? It's firstly a, um, caused by the demand for efficiency um, at work um, that happened through industrialization and urbanization, and secondly, happening through a sexist way, se way of thinking um, and the separation of private and public that ha came along with it. So this also came along with this idea of uh, the man uh, making money um, and who can't, who has to be able to de devote his entire time to producing money um, and working for the person who's employing him, which is why the woman needs to stay at home and take care of the children. That was particularly practicable because thanks to industrialization, um, money was primarily earned outside the own home and not um, on your own land anymore. And for this whole thing to work in an efficient way, um, men like Rousseau and Leibniz were positing that only the biological mother can instinctively, properly take care of the child, and that is how she, her life will be fulfilled. So in that way, women could kind of be confined to the house where they had to change diapers by themselves um, and had to take care of their husbands with love and nice and warm food. So this mother instinct, um, this natural, this natural, this idea of like women having a natural affinity for raising kids, is uh, is an invention of the past. Oh, of the of the 18th century, um, and it ma and it makes women do all this work without actually being recognized for it and without co compensating them for it. At the t and this is how this idea of the small family was born. In some ways, any attempts at trying to like recreate this idea of social parenting are generally considered as something bad. So. It's not sufficient to push all these w women into isolation, in many cases, alcoholism and poverty, but it's even worse that we've completely forgotten to take responsibility for, for each other and take care of each other. Instead, it's something that's considered critical if other people than the biological mother are taking care of the child. Allegedly, she's the only one who can actually make sure that the kid, kid is not going to turn into like a psychological wreck. So the family is also about optimizing is also about optimizing people, right? Nobody can touch the child who could potentially damage it. You could say that parents are the problem. 
them, they isolating themselves and considering other people a source of danger. But at the same time, you need to remember that our society has also turned it into almost like a hobby to tell, um, to constantly insult women and uh, parents and especially men if there's something that they do wrong. The negative views of ch children in Germany is also particularly related to the fact, the fact that we don't want to give anything to parents and it's their fault if they don't turn sac completely sacrifice themselves to the to the task of parenting but if they do they're criticized as helicopter parents so it's easier for you as a parent to avoid this shaming by simply staying by yourselves and isolating yourselves there are moments when I'm unhappy about the subtitle of my book which is called Chi happy and childless at the time, it seemed appropriate to shortly talk about and make it clear what the book was about. But sometimes I have the feeling that it's kind of like going in the wrong direction. It seems to agree with the mainstream media consensus that parents and people who don't have to, who don't have kids kind of like look at each other in negative ways. I don't want to look down on anyone else in order to justify my own way of living and celebrate it. I want to. Um, I want to create our society together with these other people, um, and that's why I want to climb over the borders of isolation that comes with parenthood. This notion of childlessness implies the incor incorrect notions if it's only if it's only linked to like biological parenthood. Um, the separation between private and public space is something that is particularly structured through how we organize uh, childcare. We only discussing. Um, Oh, that's the only reason we're discussing women being able to combine job and raising children. And only since women have actually increasingly started to work, um, study, and research is only since then have we started to discuss the potential need for creating kindergartens um, in these institutions as well. Because if the woman is, if women are leaving the home, then childcare potentially has to integrate into the spaces where they're working. So should companies turn into the firms of ages ago? Should parents be able to take their loud children into offices where nobody's going to be able to work anymore? No, but it should be completely normal that their childcare should be happening right on the side, both next to companies, universities, and the parliament. This notion that ki ch children are keeping you and distracting you from work is something that you can only hold if you don't recognize that child girls also work that needs to be done by our society. It's n not just efficient and dis it's just not as efficient, disciplined, and quiet as working at a desk. Taking care of others is sometimes exhausting and sometimes loud, but it's an important work and it's not just about um, annoying others. This is something that was made invisible by hiding women in their in her small family and by keeping her in home. And it's something you can also see in like how badly paid people are who take care of children in childcare institutions. Um, Integrating children into your everyday life also means that we should be able to um, enable parents to live with, uh, with less stress and be more integrated. Describing kids as something that is like an issue with no as a noise complaint is something like a monster from a patri patriarchal time. With this, um, I'm especially like I'm explicitly allowing every single mother to give me their full diapers um, so I can carry them to the tr trash can if they want to so they can uh, s like feed their children by themselves, be it with their breasts or a bottle, that's completely their choice. We all need to learn that children are a regular part of everyday life again. Um, to, to know that we don't have to have parents of our own, just being parents and having an awareness of solidarity is entirely sufficient for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, exactly. Um, this isolation that Sarah was describing just now was uh, one of the big motivations behind the festival, uh, but also for one of the performances that we uh, came up with before the festival. And I would really love to quickly personally tell you how that came about. Um, I have two kids, and um, both of these pregnancies were quite uh, stressful for me. They were... Um, I was felt really nauseous uh, for a long time. Uh, there was uh, two various depressive states that I slipped into. I felt it made me very isolated physically, and, and I just didn't feel very social. And that's why this time of pregnancy was nothing that was the most beautiful time of my life, as a lot of people are suggesting. I was honestly super extreme and quite restricting. And 
we come from a theatre and performance background, and I really would wanted to uh, kind of digest the experience that I had and turn it into into a piece uh, where these questions of gender identity and the role of a mother um, are raised. Um, exactly. So we did a questionnaire where we uh, got about 400 answers from people <coughs> where we had different questions that we asked around uh, pregnancy and birth and giving birth and the first times, first few weeks with, with a child, uh, the sexuality, how that has changed, how it's impacted, how the economic scenario changed, how the relationship potentially changed. Um, yeah, exactly, these kind of questions. Based on that, we uh, created the performance that um, turned into uh, turned out as a game show. Uh, there's two <coughs> quite overdrawn figures, two mothers who uh, play against each other to win the title of the Uber Mother, and uh, yeah, and we kind of uh, negotiated the uh, different fields of tension between feminism, difficult living situations, and we kind of questioned the archetype of the Uber Mother that we kept encountering even when we didn't want to. It was kind of saved within us, maybe potentially based on our own experiences with our own mothers, and uh, that's how we uh, just kind of dealt with that. And the questions of where our own needs are remaining, our own sexuality and our own independence, uh, financially as well as uh, in the relationship, uh, those are the questions that we asked ourselves. And um, what was super interesting um, was that we thought pregnancy and having children is some, such a normal existential subject and it should find room and space uh, within the theater space and the theater world and the world of the theater. And it should be completely normal to uh, work on this. And we got a lot of feedback and positive feedback, but there was also a lot of criticism um, because we quite quickly were pushed into the drawer of problematic mothers and uh, these victims and uh, of, of female uh, makers of theater that only want to criticize and don't have uh, their own vision and, and uh, really just want, uh, should be pitied. And that was quite interesting. Um, and that uh, caused us to, after the, the piece, uh, where we, we raised criticism, we really wanted to look into how does this, how can we work this out differently, and that's how we came up with the festival format. Exactly, so we wanted, um, after a critical analysis of, of motherhood, to uh, dare the utopian perspective of parenthood, uh, because we wanted to have a constructive turn and uh, look at how can we also live together in a different way. Also, because maybe we potentially have maybe uncommon ways of living, poorly amorous uh, housing projects, living in housing projects. So these kind of questions are questions that we ask ourselves anyways all the time. So we kind of ask ourselves, how do we want to live together? And um, and that's that's why it came about to that this festival came about, and that's how we we came to put this together. So we're dealing with a lot of subjects like relationship subjects, um, the topics. Of well, like two aspects really that are usually summarized under the top, like under the term family. So family is always understood as a couple relationship and parent-child relationships. Like these kind of two things are quite different relationships and quite different forms of love potentially, and they are usually subsummarized under one term, and uh, something like social parenthood or poly polyamory. Uh, is something that is like a lot of times and like rainbow families, patchwork families, uh, separated families, um, raising your kid on your own, like all these terms really kind of are not part of this ideal of family or this ideal family because this, this, these uh, different ways that could actually be summarized under the term family is never really looked at. Um, so that's what we want to do with this festival. We invited a lot of different people, and it's really important for us to enunciate that we're not trying to criticize on one, like to to criticize one particular way of of, of human of, of humans who want to live in monogamous heteronormative relationships. Like that's not our goal. Our opinion 
is who, people who want to live that way should be allowed and have the freedom to live that way. But what we want to do is that uh, show that on the one, like it's, it's that it, a lot of times we don't really have that freedom to ask yourself if that's something that you want to live and how you want to live. It's more of an like an automatic kind of process that is uh, put on you from the society. And there's a lot of people who actually do do not want to live this ideal of the nuclear family and and um, they and, and 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 they are looking for something that. That's different with, and then obviously not being one, wanting to be um, deprimented for that economically and and society like on a society level. So, in the past few years, we're we're finally uh, maybe understanding that there's uh, potentially a lot of stuff to do, and uh, quite significant. We found that two weeks ago, Pope Francisco, the Pope Francis, Franciscus is the good Pope, is the progressive Pope, uh, and he announced that. Uh, only uh, men and women together can be a family, uh, and I quote, today, it's painful to say, people speak of different families, of different forms of families. It's quite sad that the Catholic Church, uh, that, that diversity is regarded as something painful, and it's quite ironic uh, when you're taking the Catholic Church, because for thousands of years, they were uh, quite influential to uh, to to separate people by classes and hierarchies. All right, so it's uh, still a quite current situation, and it's that's something that's been reflected a lot while we while we came and created this festival for in the past years and what we encountered a lot. A round of applause for the hard labor that went into that. Thank you so much. We have a few flyers for all of you. Anybody who's interested in, please, you can take them. Um, but there's also, it's, it's quite beautiful. Like Miriam uh, personally said from like how it motivated her from a very personal space. And there's so much positive feedback and and it's really great to see that it's such a burning subject and it's, it's that, that makes us super happy. So for everyone who weren't here in the beginning, September 14th to 16th, Familia Futura in Dresden. And now we would kind of like to uh, enter into the discussion. We have a little bit of time left for that. And for that, we uh, for warming up, we wanted to do a little uh, freak up questionnaire. Uh, you, you might have noticed that we use the word freak quite positive. Uh, it's a positive uh, rebranding of the word, like the insult freak and, freak, and this is like a self-empowerment, and it's about uh, dealing with language differently. And it can have quite a positive effect on, your, on yourself and your surrounding. Normally, freaks are uh, people who are uh, varying from the norm and by this affirmative uh, self-naming um, we're, we're taking away this kind of uh, pushing out people by calling them. We're maybe different but we're not alone to quickly summarize this shortly and we might actually be quite a big group so that's how we kind of want to find out and check with you guys and the crowd. Okay, all right, so we would like to uh, raise your hand if you know people that have children without being married. All right. When you know people, if you know people who are parent and who live in separate spaces and not as a couple anymore. When you know families who live as patchwork families. If you know people who live in with the same uh, sex uh, partner that don't live monogamous, that don't live monogamous and have children, that have a care child or uh, that have adopted children or uh, are adopted. 
that are orphans that don't have a partner that don't have a partner but are raising one or more than one children on their own that cannot have children and that maybe don't want to have children. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. We have uh, a little bit of time left uh, and would like to invite you to discuss with us a little bit. In the front, there's a microphone. Uh, we have a few lines of text that we can add if you don't have questions, but we really want to invite you guys to start a dialogue with us now. Maybe just talk about yourselves. Well, first of all, thank you so much for all of that, for the three of them. If you have questions, uh, just raise your hand. I'll come over with a microphone. No worries. You are not going to be visible in the video, but you, you are going to be heard. Are there questions? Please raise your hands. Ah, great. There's a question over there. Ah, no shoes. Taking the shoes off. Um, I don't have a question, but um, I'm a little bit afraid that if the, the discussions start, I don't really want to jump in. I live in Berlin as a family with a girl that's about three years old, and we are looking for another family that potentially wants to move into our apartment. We have a two-bedroom apartment with a big, big kitchen, and if people are interested in living with a family together, we have experience on in this subject. Uh, for three years, we've lived with other families, and, and, and we know the concept, and we know what this is. And if you are potentially interested and live in Berlin and want to live in Berlin, uh, please come, uh, come up to me maybe right after this talk or uh, just find us at Wegesucht or Co-Housing or eBay Kleinanzeigen, which are all German uh, platforms. All right, all the way to the back. That's quite a challenge. Careful. Yeah, okay, it's going to keep you fit. A little bit of sport and workout is important. Well, first of all, I, th I really appreciated everything that you said. It was really cool. What you read in the beginning, I wanted to ask, and maybe if I can read that somewhere after the festival. Uh, yeah, of course, that was published on site online, and if you Google my name, then I think you should be able to find my article. Um, my name's Sarah, Sarah Deal. It should be in the flyer that has the content program. And the article was called Give Me All Your Diapers. Anybody else? All, All the, the way in the way front. In the front. <laughs> but stay in the back, and I'm just going to hand my mic over to someone here, then you don't have to walk back and forth all the time. I wanted to ask, what does patchwork family actually mean? What, what, do we, uh, what does that mean? I think that's a very good question. I define it, patchwork is yeah, like, a, it's like a piece of cloth where you have different pieces of cloth sewn together. And that's kind of a way of deficiency, right? Like a deficient way of describing it because you assume that the blanket should be whole. But generally it means that the couple relationship, so they're, you have ki kids with different partners. Oh, well, okay, wait, oh, say, let's do it chronologically. So there are people who have kids together, then they're separated, and then they have new partners, and then this new partnership with children from different constellations is a patchwork family. Yeah? It's, of course, it's like a, flu a bit of a fluid term because are they only a patchwork family once they're married or once they have kids? Like, it's, I think it's a bit open towards the edges, um, like raising kids by yourselves, raising kids together, patchwork. I mean, these are parts of a process and I think it's interesting to n recognize that looking at this term, you can tell that family is often about, uh, often puts like parent and child relations and the couple relations into one pot. And I think that's one of the problems with this ideal of marriage, where marriage 
has long been the institution of family, the only institution regulated to family. Um, and in marriage, all of these things are all getting together, right? You can't get divorced, you can't cheat on each other, monogamy, all of these are factors that play into that. Um, and everything that kind of like, di like is different from that is deficient. And so it's specifically what we want to go beyond, right? Like we want to have that openness. Um, also with regards to the way of naming these things and like of and this terminology, it's a bit difficult because we need to work with these categories. Um, you can see that really well when you look at the term of, uh, the, the German term for a woman, or for parents raising children by themselves. The term is not that nice because it's about um, loneliness, uh, mentions uh, isolation. Um, oh, single parents, right? So it's about sing, 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 single, right? So it's not, it, it implies deficiency because there's only one parent and it, usually there's supposed to be two parents. And so now there's actually the poten like a different way of talking about that, which is called um, single parent family. So, so actually you're actually talk emphasizing how it's still a family. But so yeah, it's difficult but fluid. Um, this discussion potentially only made sense in German. <laughs> um, I would be interested in what is your utopia? and what, on which levels uh, change needs to happen? I, I don't have a ready utopia, not just one utopia. I think we need many different visions and utopias, and we need to enable people through changing laws and through societal change to live all these different concepts and be able to like make it possible to live many different concepts and that would be my personal vision and i also think that it's really related to how you can live and the way you live because this isolation that we talked about is also really related to mother father child maximum three bedroom apartment and i think that's an important part that we want to talk about during the festival um, so which alternatives are there for living together and of living together? Um, so for example, if I want to could mention this with regards to myself, so um, one experience that Miri has is living in a three bedroom apartment with ma mother, father, child, 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 despite that not wanting that. So now for herself, she's made the decision to move into a massive housing project in Leipzig and so all of a sudden, you have this massive advantage that you're not by yourself with everything anymore. You can exchange ideas with others. There are other people in the house. There are other parents as well. So you can occasionally kind of like leave your parent and the kids with someone else. So everyone's used to each other. Everyone knows each other. There's a lot of trust. So suddenly, there's all this energy that's, you, that you have for other stuff and for each other as well. Um, and I think this project was also a lot of work. But yeah, I think that's a really important part of these utopias, your living situation and the way you live, the places you live, the way you co co cohabitate. And right now we're actually running a crowdfunding for our festival where we did portraits of some of the people who were participating in it, where we're presenting them and their work. And we also asked them, so what is your personal utopia? So for you, what does it mean for you, family Futura. And we got very different answers to this question. You can actually, of course, look at this online. If you Google family Futura, it's really beautiful. This whole thing about living together and living spaces, there are images of living together um, and solidarity and of many people eating together at a table. And yeah, w among other things, the festival also includes, we have Suki. And we have a really big party on September 15th, and she's going to do a concert. She's a German rapper. And we also did a clip with her. And she said that family futura for her means forming hearts. And so for her, this ideal is that you're, um, you're educating each other's hearts. And she described this image of a big family of many different people who are not necessarily related to each other by blood. That's not what it's about which I also think is the, like this weird nation, uh, par weird nation state parallel where just marriage and just like the nation state are defined through um, property and blood relations. Instead, you just should have a big table with lots of different people, old, young, um, whatever, 
all of whom are eating together and that you are essentially creating everything together and you're taking care of each other. Um, solidarity and care were things that were mentioned a lot. So all of these are key terms that are important for us right now. And what that means specifically, I mean, we also have a few workshops um, about utopic writing, um, speaking about utopias with people who are really, so for, to work with people who are really interested in developing concrete and specific visions. I don't see any more hands. Oh, no, over there, over there. A lot of them all of a sudden, actually. I think you were fast. I live in a housing project where we also have this FLTE exchange on the question of having kids, how to raise them. And I think the main thing, most, peop most kids are born in heteronormative couples, relationships, or they're single parents. And a lot of people said that it was a lot easier uh, that way. It was so much easier to, to have a child in that way because they spent so much time already as a couple. And it, it was just this thing that was uh, easy and it made sense. And, and then once you're in that couple, it's like once you're a bit older, it might become difficult to find somebody to have a child with. And I'd love to be, like, I'm super interested in how did you find one another and how these complications of, of couples in these constellations m with co-parenting. And what was the second question? Um, yeah, how did you find one another? And um, yeah, how do you experience, um, how, how does your experience compare to those of the ones that raised children uh, in the classic duo couple? like? Um, a lot of people also say it's actually a lot harder because you have to negotiate so many more people. You have to get along with everyone, and it has to be people that you want to spend time with. And do you find this more as a relief or as a rather bigger complication because you have to negotiate so many more opinions? Um, yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. Personally, I actually don't have children of my own yet. But I live in what is basically a basically poly polyamorous context and somewhat more open. So I probably can't specifically answer this question. Maybe Miri can say more about that. <coughs> yeah, so I think, of course, you always have that problem. If you have more people, you need to discuss a lot. You make a, need to make a lot of agreements. My experience with 12 years of polyamory is that sometimes things are easier with more people because you can form a consensus and you don't just have this ping pong structure. With regards to children, it can be very different because there are no role models that you can use because being, being polyamorous with children, that's also going to be a discussion at our festival. So what is it like um, to raise a child with more than one parent, uh, with several parents? Um, and so I think one thing that's really important there is the societal shaming that you're getting. And that's one important point there is, that's one of the important reasons why it's not so easy. So many people who live that have this facade to the outside of, oh, we're the biological parents and that like calms people down. Yeah, and I think on top of that, yeah, I'm, I'm really like used to that as well. I definitely know that as well. Um, um, as to my own story, I have two children with my partner and we now live in an open relationship. In the beginning, that wasn't necessarily the case either. And it wasn't like we were like, oh, it would be super nice for the kids to have more, par more parents. But there was just something that happened organically in the same way as we were getting to know each other. But so if you live this practically, you definitely notice that there, you definitely need to put more work into your relationship because it's not just um, the relationship between the grown-ups, but also between all the grown-ups and the ki children. And so about the question of how you can imagine that, um, also if you look further into the future, then I think this part of this question of work and free time and having, work, uh, having time for working on your relationship, I think it's a really important question. 
um, and discussing that uh, and have essentially proposing ideas for potentially doing that differently. Because obviously, if you work 40 hours every week, then you just don't have any time left to have relationships with five people and raising three children together based on consensus. Yeah. So in our current times, I think you really reach the borders of your own energy if you do that. And questions like um, uh, unconditional basic income um, are getting really are becoming really important if you think that far. Um, I would be interested in how did you find one another, the question that was already raised but maybe not answered, and if you consider yourself as a political structure or a collective for the festival, like how do you structure that? Yeah, the three of us met through the festival. Um, Sandra, we don't, haven't known her for that long, but we've known, we've known each other for 10 years, nine maybe. And we are friends and colleagues, I would say. We also have a we also have a shared ex. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we have quite a few points in common, um, and have lived through a few things and experienced a few things together. And we've wor been working together for um, nine to ten year nine years as a performance collective called Wild Horses, and now also for this festival, Familia Futura. So we essentially came together to work together for this festival. And we're specifically, there's the, specifically the two of us, but we're working within a massive network. But the two of us have really been working on these, on different performance things together, um, using different formats. But it's always been very personal, but have always, I've, also, I've always had a relationship on a very personal level. We're not just office buddies. All right, we still have time for one last question. Take your chance now. Ah, ah there's a hand. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. You talked about the isolation, especially of mothers in pregnancy uh, based upon uh, physical hardship. And um, maybe you have some ideas how to um, prevent this isolation to, to, to take place and how to prevent this from happening, basically. Um, I think I'll give the mic to the mother. Uh, I think f one thing that would have been helpful for myself, so a way of dealing with this whole thing that's with less taboos, um, Maybe also talking about the fact that pregnancy doesn't necessarily have to be the best time of your life, that birth also doesn't have to be that amazing, and that it actually can be quite traumatizing. And yeah. When I became pregnant, I was one of the first in my circle of friends who had a child. And I before that, I'd really lived in an environment where there was very little contact with children. And I think many people were also completely, um, they just didn't know how to handle this whole thing and they didn't know what was happening. I was living in a flat chair at the time and the flat chair was actually very happy that there would be a child. But then all of a sudden everyone was really kind of like um, um, overstrained uh, when the child was there. And I think it's really important that you talk a lot, lot about it and that you listen to each other and that you maybe think about how you can support each other together. Because I think we as a couple were also often isolated within this Fletcher, which was absurd because we'd specifically deliberately decided to live in a Fletcher and not by ourselves. And yeah, I think that was a complete failure because in many ways, once we were all confronted with the fact that there was a small baby now that was crying all the time and we were um, super exhausted and it just didn't have a, like we didn't just didn't have enough sleep and we were really like working with the less reserves of energy and I think it's really important to educate people and it's going to be helpful talking about it a lot about complications about fear of having problems at birth and yeah I think all of that is really important like talking about it a lot and uh, yeah tearing down those walls
I think something that Sarah also mentioned in her piece is also really important, which is that we as a society, that's not a strategy for individuals, but as a society, we need more spaces where children, also little children that are crying, are completely normal, and where people without children also learn how to deal with little children. Um, I'm, I have that as well. I was the youngest child in my family, so I had no idea how to deal with people who are smaller than myself. I just didn't have that experience, and so now um, in the, my circle of friends, I've kind of been like learning that, and I started learning it, and I was super excited about learning that. And um, But it's really, really difficult because those spaces don't exist. Because it's immediately considered a burden. And my friends also often talked about how they got like stupid stares once their child started crying. And just that's just how it is. I mean, there are children here who are super chill. That's amazing. But it's just a fact of life that children are sometimes loud. And if it was more normal to take children everywhere, then maybe people would also be more chill and maybe children would also be more chill about being taken everywhere and wouldn't be so loud and present. Um, so yeah, that's really like a circle basically. Um, we need spaces where children are completely normal, um, whether those are private and public spaces. In addition, there's this problem with separating public and private spaces so strictly, but I think that's something that we can all try to do something about that. For example, by moving into a housing project or, um, or a flat chair, we can try to solve that on an individual level, but it's also a structural problem that we all face. So yeah, we need to try. We'll, 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 have, a, we'll have a festival about this whole thing. That's our solution. A good first step, definitely. Uh, time is up now. Uh, Big round of applause for the three up on stage. Um, 